Tonight on Insights on PBS Hawaii. During this legislative session, civil liberties advocates and drug policy reformers lobbied for the decriminalization of marijuana. Join the debate about easing the penalties on marijuana use. Now, live in our studio, our host, Dan Boylan. Aloha, and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Boylan. A recent Pew Research poll found that a majority of Americans approve of the legalization of marijuana. This shift in public opinion was forecast this past November when voters in the states of Washington and Colorado approved ballot initiatives legalizing pot. While still illegal for recreational use, marijuana used for medicinal purposes is legal in Hawaii and 17 other states. Hawaii lawmakers this session debated marijuana-related bills that ranged from its legalization to reduction of the punishment for possession of up to 20 grams. That's 40, 47 to 50 marijuana cigarettes, right? Uh, from a petty misde misde misdemeanor to a $100 civil fine. A bill to transfer the medical marijuana program from the State Department of Public Safety to the Department of Health is still pending. Tonight, we'll explore the fate of the proposed legislation as well as examine current marijuana laws and medical marijuana's use in Hawaii. We invite you to join the conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. Or you can join our live blog. The contact information you now see on your screen will be shown regularly throughout the program. Insights is also streaming live on your computer and will be posted on our website after the broadcast. Now to our panel. Pamela Lichty is the president of the Drug Policy Action Group and serves as a board member of the Drug Policy Alliance, a national organization that promotes alternatives to current drug policies. She's also on the board of, the, of directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. Pam holds a master's degree in public health. Alan Shin is the executive director of the nonprofit Coalition for a Drug-Free Hawaii. Formed in 1987, CDFH's mission is to reduce or prevent drug abuse through collaborative efforts by educators and social service providers. Alan has served on the Honolulu Mayor's Drug Task Force as well as other organizations address addressing substance abuse. Alan holds a master's degree in social work. Charles Webb is a participating medical marijuana physician located on the Big Island and the founder of the Medical Use of Marijuana Clinic, or MUM, in uh, Hawaii. Dr. Webb also practices urgent care medicine and was an emergency room physician for over 30 years. James Hochberg is president of Hawaii Family Advocates, a nonprofit legislative action arm of the Hawaii Family Forum. Its mission is to educate, lobby for legislation, and participate in political activities that advance the interests of families, faith, and freedom. Jim is an attorney. Well, if this was the year for the legalization of marijuana, on, at least in, in elections on, uh, and, the, and uh, polls that show that opinion for it has seemed to be rising, why didn't it get anywhere in this session of the legislature? Pam, you watch this fairly closely. I watch it very closely. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks for having all of us here tonight. This is a, a really timely discussion. And uh, we're pleased that Hawaii is finally having a serious conversation about marijuana. Um, the joking has kind of stopped and people are looking at it seriously. There were about 20 bills introduced this session on all aspects of marijuana, um, indicating uh, you know, the interest level that, that's out there. Um, as you said, uh, Colorado and, and Washington State taking the bold move to legalize it through uh, voter initiatives really kind of set the stage and a lot of other states are now looking to see what, what they can do to reform what they see as non-functional uh, laws. Um, 16 states have already, have already decriminalized, including some really surprising ones like Mississippi, Ohio, Nebraska. And as now, you what do you mean by decriminalize? Okay. Um, you know, in some states it's a little bit different, but generally it means uh, removing criminal penalties for possession of a small amount, and the amount varies from state to state, and replacing it with a civil uh, fine, a citation like a parking ticket. And uh, usually, uh, yeah, a fine of usually $100 is the average, and one ounce is about the average amount that's permitted. Uh, so, uh, and, and we have not done that? No, we have not. Uh, uh, and is there any, and there's nothing still alive at the legislature that would indicate we're going to do it this year? 
well, you know, things can happen at the last minute, but it looks like no. Um, it went um, through the Senate where it passed unanimously. This is a bill to decriminalize. Um, and then it went over to the House, went through several committees, uh, went all the way to the floor of the House, and they voted to recommit it to committee, to the Judiciary Committee, the last one that had it. And that means that they didn't think they had the votes to pass it. But neither did anyone have to go on record to say what, where they stood. Alan Shin, why, why, why don't you want these bills to pass? Why shouldn't we legalize? I think uh, marijuana is, is a health problem for Hawaii, and I think legalization is, the, uh, is what happens when um, people are not really informed about um, the drug. So I think the uh, past uh, attitudes and opinions about marijuana, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions, and I would say that um, you know, it, it's a major problem in terms of trying to educate people and catch them up because I think many of our opinions and, and feelings about marijuana go way back to, you know, I think in the 60s and 70s. And so what we're seeing is that um, with all this science-based um, information that we now have on marijuana, we haven't, our opinions and, um, you know, feelings about it have not really caught up with the technology and the science that we have now. What, what, what science, are specific, specifically, I can say that word, uh, are, are you referring to that, that says that, that marijuana is, is a health problem, that it's, it's going to cause us trouble? Right. I think we have to look at, I think we have to look at marijuana like we look at other drugs, and that's, it's a public health issue. Um, there are harmful effects of uh, any drug, but for marijuana, um, we know that it's linked to, uh, associated with psychosis, with um, uh, depression, paranoia, and this is with chronic, I'm talking about chronic, persistent use of high-grade, potent marijuana that we have nowadays. It's not the same marijuana that our, maybe we've smoked, Dan, you and I smoked way back in the, the days. Not me, maybe you were, <laughs> not, not, not me, not, not that kind of guy. But, but, yeah, so, you know, the potency now is, is, much, is much higher. I mean, it's, uh, marijuana's been GMO'd um, and now we have potency levels that are 10 times what it was in the 60s and 70s. Uh, is that true, Charlie? I mean, I've read something on that, on that too, and they seem to indicate that it is more potent. Well, this, this is a bit of sophistry. They, the people who are opposed to marijuana pretend that it's dangerous because it's perhaps been improved from 4% to 8% THC. That's what they're talking about. A THC is the, it's the most psychoactive actor. chemical in marijuana or okay. cannabis. If we're talking medically, the proper word would be cannabis, but marijuana covers it. Um, but anyway, the federal government, the DEA, actually brags about how effective 100% THC Marinol pills are and then tries to get us to believe that 8% is dangerous while 100% is perfectly fine in pill form. So there's a double standard. In fact, the whole history of marijuana represents a double standard. It was originally made illegal because of people with color, Mexicans and black musicians and black people. It was definitely made to hurt these people. It still does. That's who's, who's in jail now because of this, are hundreds of thousands of people of color, young people, and it ruins their life. The health hazards, uh, he will not be able to name. I can address the psychosis thing if you'd like. That's one of the many things that are brought up. They're defaults. But but I I, I was I have read a little bit on it, and, and as as I understand it, that that uh, it can be addictive, in one in a, what is it one Minimally in eleven addictive. users. If the they Hawaii start. Medical Association has a resolution which says that it is minimally or non-addictive, and they recommend that it be down scheduled so that it can be prescribed. And perhaps he knows more than the Hawaii Medical Association on this, but I really doubt it. Um. Well, let me jump in there. Yeah, go ahead. In 2011, the DEA was petitioned to uh, unschedule it as a Schedule One drug. And based on scientific evidence, they declined. So I would think that the federal government regulators of marijuana that, that require that it be a Schedule One drug would know what they're talking about. Well, what, and doesn't the science say something about uh, if, if kids use it very young, there, there is a danger. In fact, some of the decriminalization, as I understand it, said it's decriminalized for people over 21. Isn't that right? Isn't that where Colorado has gone and more Washington? Yeah. And the bill and here is, isn't that based on science? No. 
No, it's based on guesswork because none of us want our children doing coffee. None of us want our children doing cigarettes. We don't want our children doing psychoactive drugs, even though we sometimes let them drink Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola full of caffeine. But the federal government did not base their studies on science. It was pure politics. The judge in, uh, who reviewed it said it should be downscheduled, and they have no science. I was just in federal court, and I had the entire federal brief from the DEA. In that brief, here's what they said about psychosis. This is from the federal government, DEA, who's against marijuana. At present, the data do not suggest a causative link between marijuana use and the development of psychosis. Whereas, if I give you, like, a shot of cortisone, here's a thing from the flyer. It says, uh, can lead to frank psychotic manifestations. Emotional instability or psychotic tendencies may be aggravated by corticosteroids, otherwise known as steroid rage. There's always a double standard here. It's usually hypothetical dangers of marijuana, but they never have the studies or the evidence to show danger. We're talking about a pill which is less addicting than caffeine and safer than Tylenol and aspirin, and yet they have it classified and treated as more dangerous than heroin. There's no science there. It's pure politics, and the federal government has been very disingenuous. Well, Dan, the Controlled Substances Act mandates that um, the scheduling and approval of drugs, including marijuana, must be done on both legal and scientific bases. So if they're not following the statute and making political decisions, I, I yeah. wouldn't think that's what's going on. Dad, I, there's been studies, too. I mean, there's been long-term studies about the effect of marijuana on especially young people under 18, and um, shown that there is uh, signs, there are, it correlates to negative, you know, memory loss, um, learning disabilities, um, and, it, and it, you know, goes on and on. So I think that there are studies that really show that, Dr. Webb. I yes, and if, if you want to protect the children, you have to be honest. And the problems here are, number one, if you lie to the children and tell them marijuana is dangerous, which I was lied to and it made me very skeptical. I didn't believe the other things they told me because they were dishonest to me and they told me marijuana was dangerous. The other thing is, it's already available everywhere. My three kids all went to high school on a military academy and they could get any drug they wanted at school. Prohibition means the dealer gets to decide who does it rather than the government. And I don't know, that's not what I want. Well, you know, our, our agency does uh, prevention, but we also do treatment. So we work with juvenile drug court and many of the children, um, the kids who come in, the youth who come in, um, have problems with drugs, obviously. Um, and marijuana is usually one of them. And we see a lot of uh, problems around um, their chronic use of marijuana. Um, functioning level, um, just their behavior, lower functioning. Yep. Um, they, they have a problem with it. It's just and like any other drug. If you want the use to go down, it goes down in, in countries where it has been decriminalized. In Holland, they have single digit teen use. We have a war on drugs and we have 30 some percent teen use. If you really want teen use and youth use to go down, you legalize it and regulate it. Yeah. I was going to say that, um, you know, I think we could go on all night with dueling studies. There's studies that show uh, uh, totally opposite things. But, and I, I'd like to stipulate as a public health person that all psychoactive drugs uh, have some degree of harm. It's a matter of, it's a matter of degree. So, um, I think our argument is that uh, we're already regulating alcohol and tobacco, which are objectively far more harmful. Um, and, and so why are we treating this as, as you know, something that is, is beyond the pale? Um, some of the, the criteria that the federal government uses for the scheduling that Jim was referring to, it has to, for something to be Schedule One, which is the most, the strictest penalty, um, or excuse me, the, the strictest schedule, and it means that it can't be used for research um, unless the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, agrees, which they often do not. And it has to meet all three criteria. Yes. And they are uh, that has no recognized medical value, well, 18 states plus D.C. disagree about that, that it has a high potential for abuse. We can argue that one, but it's, again, a matter of relative harms, I would say. And the third criteria is that? It's too unsafe for physicians to prescribe, and then we've never had a death from it. Every other thing I can prescribe can kill people. Even caffeine can kill people in overdose. I've seen it personally. 
Nobody's died from it, and they're saying it's too dangerous for doctors to prescribe. That's not science. Well, well isn't one of the arguments that, that it, it's an entry-level drug? Isn't that a fairly common argument that, 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 that's used, that you start with marijuana, and then you, and then you add the, the meth, I guess, uh, and, and so on? Is, there, is that any viability to yeah, that? Yeah, I don't think we're talking reefer madness. Uh, nowadays, you know, that's that's gone. That part is gone. I think what um, what I think what we're saying is that it, it can be uh, it can be a gateway drug for some people, not everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way your brain is wired. Um, you know, your potential for addiction sometimes it, it's hereditary. Um, but um, you know, no, I, I wouldn't say it's a gateway drug for everyone. I think for some people it is, and and we have people who have come to our clinic seeking assistance, who said, yeah, I started with marijuana, and now I'm on meth, or I'm on cocaine, or on heroin, and I started when I was 15 years old. So you see that pattern of addiction. You do, but, I mean, in certain individuals, certainly. Yes. But the gateway theory has been discredited for a long time, and uh, a really definitive one was in 1999 when the Institute of Medicine issued a report about the various properties of, of marijuana. And they said that uh, there is no conclusive evidence, and this is a quote, that the drug effects of marijuana are causally linked to the subsequent abuse of other illicit drugs. So yes, there may be a pattern that you see in one particular person that they start with marijuana. Well, they start with that, Usually, actually, they start with alcohol and nicotine. Those are so readily available. But they would start with marijuana almost naturally because it's the, uh, the most prevalent by far. Um, some uh, 10 million Americans uh, still use it, and uh, I can't remember the figure for uh, who ha people have used it over the years. But it's the most readily available. So it, it just sort of makes sense. But there's other theories, too, that uh, non-conforming teenagers are likely to try it because it's out there, because it sounds exciting, because there's a forbidden fruit angle to it. Um, and the other thing that I think is valid about the gateway effect is that it gives the person who is acquiring the marijuana exposure to the other drugs that are on the black market. So, um, and I think we could talk about ice and marijuana in Hawaii and there's a kind of an interesting connection there. But there's also, there's also the conforming teenagers who currently wouldn't smoke marijuana because it's illegal. And if it was legalized or decriminalized, uh, then that gate for them would be gone. And I think that's an important point as well. Now, Ellen's not going to believe me, but I really didn't use marijuana very much. Uh, very <laughs> I was much. very much. Yeah. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as, I, as I tell people, it tended to put me to sleep, and that wasn't the way I liked to party. Uh, but, but uh, I have talked to some young people about this. I've talked to some younger generations, and, and, and I am struck by what Jim says. A, a lot of people are not, a lot of young people are not using marijuana. And while I've talked mm -hmm. to some who say, oh, Dad, every, Dad, I said something, didn't there? Uh, <laughs> everybody uses marijuana. Everybody's doing marijuana. You don't know anybody under a certain age that's not doing marijuana. I, I've also talked to a lot of kids who are not doing it mm -hmm. and have no Tension of doing it, and and what if, if we put it out there along with the wine shop and the you know the coffee shop and the and the and the and the saloon? Aren't they going to be doing it? No, like I said, the experiment has already been done. You have places like Portugal and Holland, which have decriminalized it completely, and use goes down, and their 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 teenagers and their youth have a much lower rate of use because it's no longer cool. If grandma uses it, it's not cool. Or if my parents smoke it, it's not cool. So there's a huge forbidden fruit thing. I'd, I'd kind of like to stand this argument on its head because there's something that people outside of medical cannabis don't know about. And it's actually gaining a reputation as an exit drug. I have many patients who come to me. I had one yesterday that I certified and they'll be on massive doses of opioids, which are things like Oxycontin, known as hillbilly heroin. These are deadly drugs. One pill can kill a kid. These are legal prescriptions. These cause more deaths now, the prescription drugs, than traffic fatalities in most states. And these things are very dangerous. And many of my patients come and get certified, and within a year of using medical marijuana to relieve their pain and with encouragement, they're able to taper off and completely get off these deadly drugs. So it's actually an exit drug in many ways. The argument that it leads to other drugs is just 
one of those ad hoc, ergo prompter hoc, after the fact, therefore because of the fact, the, because of the fact, the, the rooster crows and the sun rises, therefore the, the rooster made the sun rise. People use marijuana bef before other drugs because it's milder and safer, and that's the first thing they try. I mean, you could go back to, I used milk first, or anything that you like, you know, apple pie, whatever. You know, Jim's reference to uh, that there'll be a jump in use, not yeah. only among uh, teenagers, but among adults, you know, may be true to a certain extent. But um, most places that have decriminalized, and I said there, as I said before, there's this whole list of states that have, um, they found the use has actually gone down. And uh, I don't think anybody can really offer a good explanation for it, except that some of the mystique has been taken, taken away from it. Um, but that's what the evidence shows. Well, well you're, uh, uh, yeah. you're aware of that study um, in Colorado after they decriminalized that the random drug testing of teenagers was greatly increased the prevalence of having smoked marijuana in, just recently. And the school expulsions in Colorado have risen because of marijuana. Well, you know, that's, that's in the last year. kind of a different topic, but uh, evidence shows that for kids to remain engaged in school and in community is better than kicking them out of school where they may sit around all day and smoke marijuana. Well, but, but as, as I understand, any, any bill that's being discussed, the, uh, decriminalizing, uh, they would still regulate in regard to youth, right? Yes. Uh, yes. There would be a 21-year age group, uh, 21 it's you couldn't have it uh, before the age of 21. And it is, it's as dangerous to drive on marijuana, right? You, Alan, you've yeah. admitted that you're a big user. Uh, <laughs> yeah, or were a big <laughs> user. It was, dangerous. <laughs> it was dangerous to drive. You knew that. He under, doesn't look uh, maimed. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but that's against the law. Driving while intoxicated is already against and, the law. And how will they know how to measure the levels of intoxication with the precision that they can with alcohol. Check with the pot. redness How are they of the eyes. That? It's the no, but I'm, I'm, no, that's a right. serious question. There's, there's right. no precision with alcohol either. I mean, we all know that. You know, I would see pe you know, a, a person who's not used to alcohol will have a level of 80 and be highly intoxicated. An alcoholic will come in with a level of 600 and talk to you without slurring. I mean, there's, there's no accuracy to alcohol I, either. We make our best guess and we go with it. I, but I guess, alcohol yeah. is thousands of times more dangerous than alcohol. Most people who are not acquainted with, with marijuana. Than marijuana, people who are unacquainted with marijuana imagine it for lack of a better comparison as being something like alcohol. It's just the opposite. It makes people nice. It makes them laugh rather than making them fight and drive automobiles too fast. It might make them drive automobiles too slow, and I agree they should not because they'll go too slow. Yeah, we've seen 40 years of, you know, SAMHSA and uh, NIDA have tracked the drug use over 40 years, and when the perception of harm for a drug goes down, use goes up. And when, you know, uh, perception harm goes up, use goes down. We've seen this pattern. But, and Alan, there's other factors at play, and I think if you look at tobacco as a comparison, I think it's really apt, and that is the social attitudes and the role of education, which is near and dear to your heart and to ours as well. And that is, you know, dramatic uh, decreases have been seen across the country in adult and teenagers using tobacco. And that's been, been a matter of uh, public education and also pressure. Now, in our parents' day, it was glamorous to, to smoke cigarettes. You know, think of the old movies. And now, my 87-year-old mother said she felt like a pariah when she was smoking in public. So I guess, I guess there's really a difference, though, between tobacco and, and marijuana. And I think that... Um, uh, the addictive uh, qualities of marijuana, uh, one in six youth become addicted, one in 10 adults. 53% in Hawaii uh, youth are in treatment because of marijuana. And they're not, they're, not being, they're not being forced to come in. A lot of them are coming in on their own because they can't function. Well, that they're that really worried about it. My, un my understanding is that of they're- the, of, the, is, of the yeah. kids who yeah. come in for treatment. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Not, not oh, 53 oh, yeah. Yeah. But aren't, aren't, many, of, was right. <laughs> aren't no. many of those court court uh, uh, mandated no, no, no. referrals? No, no, no. A lot of this is school based, mm -hmm. yeah, where me, it's voluntary. Me. It's voluntary, and confidential. So kids are coming in and asking for help. Mm -hmm. They're not being the counselor's not sending them and yeah. say you go see it because you're having problems. They're coming in because this potency of this marijuana. Mm -hmm. Is so is so high. We have to get back to that potency okay. issue, but I'm I'll, let, I'll that, let Charlie. Let me go address ahead. that. Um, you know, that's the worst case scenario. One in six become addicted, and, and he's trying to compare it to cigarettes. Cigarettes, 
if you smoke a second cigarette as a teenager, your chances are five out of six of being addicted. It's the world's most addicting drug known is cigarettes. That's why it's so harmful is because it's so addicting. More than a thousand people a day die from cigarettes because people are so addicted they chain smoke and they get up to 100, 200, 300, 400,000 cigarettes and they kill themselves. That never happens with marijuana. There's never been a single death from it. And the, the DEA itself says that the addiction probability is less than coffee. Now granted, coffee has some addiction. If, if I love coffee and if you quit coffee and you're accustomed to it, you'll get a pretty severe headache. I have patients, medical marijuana patients, who go to the mainland and they cannot take their medicine. And I say, how did you do? And they said, well, I missed my medicine. I said, well, did you get sick or have any withdrawal symptoms? They just laugh at you. Mm -hmm. You ask an emergency doctor, have you ever seen someone come in for withdrawal from marijuana? They would laugh at you. They would think you were foolish. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you talking about? Whereas I see people come the other direction from the mainland who are on opioids like Oxycontin, meth, fentanyl. These people are desperate. They get here and their prescriptions are not refillable. They're going into miserable withdrawal, which is very dangerous and could possibly kill them if they have heart problems or other medical problems. Yeah, well, I think so there's no Dr. comparison in the yeah. dangers. Yeah, well, I think I think. But I think you'd agree. Well, I I don't I don't really agree. I think that uh, marijuana. We've seen it that uh, marijuana in our clinics that uh, youth who come in for uh, problems with marijuana mm -hmm. display the same kinds of uh, problems that people on other drugs have that are just, uh, just as addicting. So I don't think you can just say that marijuana is a harmless drug. I think that's one of the misconceptions that's out there that's forming we these have not yeah. said that policies. It Nobody's saying it's harmless and nobody's saying we want youth to do it. We're just saying it, there is a double standard. Things that are clearly much more addicting and much more dangerous are treated as safe, fine, you can go ahead and use them. Whereas here is something which is much safer and there's a double standard. This is being treated as more dangerous than heroin. That's hypocrisy. I want to. Well, I want to uh, ask about another a bigger hypocrisy. I mean, uh, we either proudly or I, I think many of us proudly, but some of us not so proudly, uh, sent a man to the presidency who is one of the last three men who have held the presidency, uh, all of whom ha have been uh, users of marijuana. Uh, uh, Bush, uh, Obama, and and. Uh, and Clinton, he of course he only experimented with it. You know. He didn't. Uh, 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 but I mean, we had three presidents. I said, you know, you, you're a lawyer. Why, if these guys, the presidents, can use marijuana, used marijuana, how can we suddenly criminalize it for a a, a, a black kid who's uh, who's you buy some and or is trading or selling it in Harlem or somewhere, or a white kid who's who's bought some, how can we do that? I mean, you know, uh, the president was down there in Pono, just slurping it up, but you have along to, with a lot of other people of his generation. But you have to recognize that he isn't doing it as the president. So obviously, except for Bill Clinton, I would guess they all quit long ago. I, maybe Bill Clinton did too, I don't know. Well, he said he did. They he are. likes to have fun. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he does like to days. have fun. He's, but he's I mean, isn't, is, isn't there a kind of legal, uh, you know, you know when the, you, you got a. You ever been on one of those places where somebody puts a walk and says everybody has to stay on the sidewalk, and yet you know that everybody's walking up this way. They're going across the lawn because it's the closest thing, and it makes all the sense in the world. And 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 these kids are using it. I mean, they're using marijuana, and and they don't seem to be. Many of them don't seem to be hurt by it. They have. They become president of the but, United States. But Dan, I want to... <laughs> oh, I mean, smart enough to be president. Yeah. Dan, could I, could I jump yeah. in? Because what we haven't talked about is the criminal penalties. We've been talking about the health yes. risks and all that. But the criminal penalties are a huge deal and one of the reasons that we think the laws should be reformed. And those laws are not falling evenly on all... Uh, sectors of the population. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Barack Obama, growing up as a young African American, um, he was lucky. What would have happened if he had been busted? Would he have gone on to the career that he had? He would have had a criminal record that stayed with him for the rest of his life that might have impeded him from getting federal college loans, uh, uh, housing, employment, uh, you know, job recommendations. It, it sticks with you for the rest of your mm -hmm. life. And uh, we've just had an economic study done in Hawaii, and uh, a UH economist, and he was really shocked to see these numbers jump out at him about the discrepancies in um, in the uh, people who are being busted for marijuana. If you're Native Hawaiian, you have a 70 percent higher chance of being arrested. And all the research, and I think you guys would agree, shows that 
pretty much every ethnic group uses it in the, at the same amounts throughout the country. And yet, who are the ones who are, who are getting arrested? Yeah, I think Pam is, uh, Pamela's talking about social disparities here, and I think it's, uh, if you're going to talk about um, uh, single out Hawaiians, I think you could say that for just about any, any issue that comes up, whether it's welfare or the number of Hawaiians in prison. Sadly, I would agree with you. There, I think the yeah. Hawaiian population is marginalized, and I don't think you know, marijuana is the only issue here. No, you're right. But I think the, the explanation could be, though, that uh, Hawaiians, because of their socioeconomic status, um, they aren't able to access services mm -hmm. as well as, say, that, mm -hmm. that white kid who lives in Hawaii Kai yeah. who can pay for counseling or treatment. Mm -hmm. um, this Hawaiian kid cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the reason is that they don't have access to services. I think we're in agreement on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, Bill from Hilo, I've been using cannabis most of my life. I've raised two Harvard grads. The anti-cannabis guys are wrong. It's not a gateway drug. It encourages cops to take away marijuana without due process. We don't need government interference. It should be up to the adult individual. On the big island there, medical practitioners, you're one of them, who issue licenses to individuals, right, uh, to use pot for medical purposes. Is the state aware of this, and how would it state legalization <laughs> be different? They are aware. Right? Of course they're aware. <laughs> it has to go through the Narcotics Enforcement Division here in Honolulu. It's run by the state. It's but how do they get it then? If, if, if it's illegal, then how do you get it? Can you prescribe it? No, nobody can prescribe it, and that's part of the problems. Uh, we have patients come to us, say elderly people with cancer, and they say, okay, I have my certification. Where can I get my medicine now? And this is one more double standard. And we go, well, they make no provisions for that. You, you, you have to find it on your own. And they go, well, we don't know anybody. Aren't there any stores? And no, there aren't any stores. And even at, at best, if you can find seeds, which are still illegal, you have to grow it for three or four months instead of being able to go and get your nice, safe medicine at a store. So this is one of many issues of patient rights where they're discriminated against. I can write you for Oxycontins and you can just walk over to the drugstore and get this totally fatal drug, but the safe one is, is not there. It's, it's a double standard all the way and it, it has been for 76 years. I think we would uh, agree with Dr. Webb. Um, for that 5% of those people who have the cancer, HIV, AIDS syndrome, uh, glaucoma, who are truly uh, needing some kind of relief for pain or nausea, um, but you know, for the 95% uh, who have more soft tissue kinds of, of, of pain or issues, um, those who are obviously are under 30 years of age, uh, many of them are, and even those who are under 18, which I am amazed that there's, you know, kids who, are, who parents are signing off on their medical marijuana cards. Well, and I don't know all the details about them, but I would say that there's something that's not right with there. Actually, there's, there's over 100 million people in this country with chronic pain. People need relief, and they need safe relief. You know, the Hippocratic Oath says, first, do no harm. Here we have an excellent pain medicine which kills nobody, and we're not given the option to use it. And people need relief. I mean, it's very inhumane to deny them this safe medication when they are stuck with the ones that they hate. People who go on the opioids tell me they're depressed, they want to commit suicide, they get hospitalized three times a year because they're constipated, they're totally addicted, they go into withdrawal if they run out of their medicine. You're they're... making me depressed describing this. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a fact, <laughs> and here is something safe that they can be using, and yet we deny them. But right. the thing is, the federal government holds it as a Schedule One drug. So the federal government should be enforcing that in these states that are allowing medical marijuana, that for political reasons they are choosing not to, but in our system, federal law preempts state law that's contrary. So Actually. they should be should be enforcing and they just aren't. But isn't the but but isn't the the hasn't the president and the attorney general said we're we are not going to prosecute? Isn't isn't that right? I, I don't think they've said, but they just aren't. I, well, I don't think they, they've they said. have made pronouncements in the past, but then they, they haven't always followed through. <laughs> but um, th I wanted to address the issue of federal preemption mm -hmm. because that's one that we hear a lot and that there's a lot of misunderstanding about. States have the right to regulate their, to use their law enforcement uh, resources in any way they wish. And they can set up any kinds of laws that they wish about these substances. They are under no obligation to enforce federal law. 
And one of the reasons that the feds don't go after patients, for example, is they simply don't have the resources. I mean, we're talking about 18 states. And where do you think the political will would be in, in arresting sick people? Well, what yeah. I, I think you misunderstood me, because I was saying that the federal government should be enforcing the scheduling of it as a Schedule One drug and not allow the states to have medical marijuana. That's just as a law professor looking at the statutes, that's what they should be doing. And for whatever reason, it's not happening. But what about the Tenth Amendment and the state's rights the to Tenth do Amendment things their own way? The Tenth Amendment is barely breathing. I mean, you, you see all those HHS mandate cases and stuff. It, mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Does marijuana kill brain cells or does it inhibit development? Uh, Ashley and Mo'ili Ili wants to know. We don't know. Do we? I'm not That's a doctor, a great... but I think you have to be dead before they can do the autopsy. Yeah, there's no evidence of that. I mean, <laughs> Carl Sagan smoked it his entire life. That's why his, he was such a great teacher, and he was totally brilliant. So there's, there's no evidence of that. There are some studies, though, I think, and, and I'm sure that you folks have other studies, but uh, it shows that there is a loss of IQ points for, for long-term persistent use of marijuana. Um, even when you stop using it after you're 18, um, you don't regain that. But, but again, I've, heard, I've never it. heard of those. Yeah. I, I have no idea there, what I you're talking about. I can you show you. Yeah. I doubt it. It's, it's a long in New term Zealand. Thing. It's New Zealand. It's in New Zealand. It's in, That's right. It's in Dunedin, which is a, a relatively small city in New Zealand. And it's been, I don't want to say debunked, but there's this great debate about it now. It got all sorts of publicity when it first came out. The fact is that this uh, group of uh, people who were in the study, and I can't remember the size of it, they were all Maori kids, um, so indigenous New Zealanders. And they were all from uh, low socioeconomic classes. And the people who did the study, it was a prospective study, which means they studied them for years, this same group of kids. And um, they were all sorts, they didn't control for the other variables. These kids didn't have good nutrition, arguably. You know, their housing situation was tenuous. They were they were living in, uh, in poor conditions. So it's not as clear cut as it might appear to be. Uh, two questions to the panel if, uh, by David of Honolulu. If drugs are legalized, how do we prevent underage people from using drugs? Are you in favor of legalizing all illegal drugs? Come on, you proponents, are you for all illegal drugs? That's not what we're talking about tonight. Um, I think we need to start we're with the- topic. I think we need to start with the drug that is the most readily available, the most widely if, used, yeah, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm saying, Pam, yeah. is that the person who sent this in mm -hmm. is obviously fearful that mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. precisely what will happen. The, 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 the slippery the slope. for yeah. the decriminalization at the legislature and the legalization was the 15% tax that the state would reap off of the sale of, of mm -hmm. uh, legal marijuana. And so that caller is on to something the legislature could really rack in the taxes if mm -hmm. everything was decriminalized and legalized and then taxed. Well, I'm you not, know, that I'm, is a reason, in, in all in honesty, that a lot of states are going this way. But it's not in isolation. It's because they, they see these other ways of looking at it, which is take the law enforcement uh, resources that are being used for arresting marijuana users, estimated to be $9 million in Hawaii every year from this UH economist, and divert those to things that the voters of Hawaii think are more important uses of that money. And there was a poll that was done recently by QMark, a very reputable polling yeah, firm, at the point. end of last year. Yeah. And they found that 58% of voters in Hawaii uh, approve of decriminalization. But that okay. QMark had 603 members in the, in the study. It's a very small study. And are you, are you referring to the David C. Nixon uh, yes, public policy? Center? Yes, I am. Very interesting, because the, um, the the way that they were figuring out this $9 million was to take the number of marijuana arrests 1400 and consistent. multiply it by the, or the percentage, and, mul and multiply that against the total cost of, of the criminal justice system, rather than looking at the incremental cost per arrest. And, and um, at one of the legislative hearings, one, all the county police departments were against the uh, bills. But he said that the most of the divisions in the police department don't do any arrests at all. And their costs are in that big number that the percentage is applied to. And that's just not the proper way to measure what the effect on the criminal justice budget is going to be. I actually have the stats right here in front of me. So um, 14,000? 1,400. 1,400. Per well, year. What we have here from um, our, our attorney general and prosecutor's office, 594 arrests in 2012 mm -hmm. for small 
uh, possession of small amounts of marijuana. Only seven of them were, uh, were confined greater than 10 days. Mm -hmm. Most of them were either uh, dismissed. Half of them were dismissed. One and of our callers, Ken, said, comes to, uh, he said how many people had been arrested by Honolulu police. He says, uh, on Oahu only uh, for marijuana sales. He said, I can't think of anybody. Well, he, he can't uh, and that's what it's saying here. It's less than 1% of, yeah. of well, all the arrests, that. Pam. So I don't know where you get that, you know, well, 1,400. If you look at Professor Nixon's uh, uh, study, I he's did. got his citations are from the, the FBI Bureau of Crime Statistics and from state statistics. He didn't make these up out of whole cloth. And let me just he say must have that miscounted though, because you know I have 594. That's all. I believe all. his his came from uh, 2010. That was the latest oh, data that this was is publicly 2012. available. So the police have more recent data. And I would just say that none of us are is an economist, and I think this stuff is very difficult to understand. And, um, you know, have an economist on next time, and we can talk about the, uh, the, the way he did it. Charlie, this is from Elizabeth in Kaimu Key. She's got a real problem. How, how, uh, can you discuss how to access medical marijuana? You mentioned they have to get the, the approval. Uh, cancer patients must find a drug or dealer or grow their own. She's about to start chemotherapy and wants to know how to get it. Actually, when, you know, that is the problem. That's what I was trying to point out. The, the state of Hawaii makes no provisions. In fact, when I certify someone, they make me initial that I will in no way facilitate the acquisition of marijuana. Can you imagine that? If it's said, well, I have this other treatment for you, but I'm sorry, I can't talk about how to get it. it and you're not even allowed to talk about it. That, that's one of the many things in patient rights that needs to be fixed. It's very unfair. There are many people in need. I think we like, need to roll back to when the legislature enacted this law, which is, was in the year 2000. Right. This goes back to something somebody asked a few minutes ago. Now, how did this all happen? Well, the legislature, uh, Governor Cayetano introduced the bill, and the legislature passed it in 2000. And we were the first state to pass a medical marijuana law through the legislature. Up until then, it had all been by voter initiative, which is a whole different process. Um, they didn't make any provision for a dispensary system or a distribution system right. because in those days uh, there was no there were no models out there but now all of the states that have come on board after us and many of them were legislative and some of them were by initiative have some kind of distribution system Rhode Island's just opened this week Washington DC's got one Massachusetts one of the most recent states has one it has to be part of it otherwise you're, the patients are being forced to go to the black market, and it's it just doesn't make sense. I think two comments. One is I think Dr. Webb will have a comment too about it. That um, there's other ways to get the beneficial uh, effects of marijuana, the cannabinoid part that is uh, supposedly the more healing part, and um, that's uh, Marinol, which is a pill form which can be prescribed, and Sativix, which is an oral spray. So the difference is you don't get high but you get the benefits from that uh, cannabinoid. Um, why do you need to smoke marijuana in order to get the benefits? Well, Just like you don't have to smoke opium to get the effects of morphine, right? We, yeah. we get in a pill form yeah. or in a, and a doctor can prescribe it. So why don't we look at that? I mean, that's where I think we could have some common ground is that we should be pushing the FDA for more uh, research and testing on products like Sativix, which is an oral spray. Which is not approved in this country yet. That's right, but we should, that's why I said, we should be pushing FDA to hurry it up. Mm -hmm. let's, let's have a, the, let's have reason, a, you know. The an, reason they cannot pilot project. Is, is because of the people who are opposing rescheduling. It's stuck in Schedule 1, and as a Schedule 1 drug where the government very dishonestly has it stuck, pretending it's a dangerous drug, you're not allowed to do beneficial research. It's strictly forbidden. Now, we'll talk about Marinol so you, and, I will, and Sativex. I'd love to talk about okay. Marinol and Sativex. Marinol's a pill. This is what I mentioned earlier. It's 100% THC, synthetic THC, which is the most psychoactive drug, and it does get you high if you take it. Okay. Almost nobody likes the pill. It costs $25 a pill. It's over $2,000 for a month's supply, and it doesn't work well. The perfect way to take cannabis is either in a tincture, which, where you can titrate your dose and not get too much because you want to stay functional and just get the pain relief, or better yet, you get a vaporizer. And a vaporizer is smokeless, rapid, reliable, titratable. There's a thing called patient-controlled analgesia that is the best means of pain control ever devised. They use it in hospitals. You have a little button to push your pain medicine. You don't overshoot. You don't undershoot. You get better pain control, and you use less medicine. 
When you're using a vaporizer, you're doing exactly the same thing. You titrate your own medicine, you take one little puff and see if it's good. If it relieves your pain, you stop. And you can relieve pain at levels that are lower than where you get a buzz. Whereas if you're forced to take Marinol, you're going to get fairly buzzed because you can't control the dose. Sativex is nothing more than concentrated hash oil, which has got a peppermint flavor, and you spray it under your tongue, and they pretend it goes through the skin, but it doesn't. You have to swallow it, and it takes an hour to get in your system. It's legal in Canada, Great Britain, several other countries. It costs $7 a spray in Canada, whereas if you go to a compassion club, you can get the same thing that's two cents a spray. The pharmaceutical industry wants to keep these things and keep them expensive. They're one of the main forces that prevent this from becoming legalized or decriminalized. Yeah, so I think we would agree with you that uh, you know pharmaceutical companies are should be held accountable also. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still lost about how you can uh, dose um, a marijuana joint. I mean, well, how do you do I that? Just, I, mean, I just told you how. You, you take a little bit, and this is patient-controlled analgesia. No, this is what works. How do you prescribe works. that? Do you say take two hits? No, and you say take one, and you stop, and you wait, and you see if it was enough. If, if it's enough, you stop. If it's not, then you decide. So, You're the one who's feeling the pain. You're the only so one that knows. So it's not measurable then. But wait, Alan. And interestingly, in the Sativex uh, you know, brochure, the information that comes with the uh, spray, it says, the patient should take a dosage sufficient to alleviate symptoms, and it will vary from person to person. So they acknowledge the fact that, that um, you know, it isn't, and that's why a lot of physicians don't like it, because it isn't a nice little neat pill and you get 50 milligrams or whatever. But it's got a history of, of uh, beneficial results. And physicians but don't know the correct dose. We're very arrogant when we pretend we know you need 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams of this. It's an experiment when you take it. Whereas you do know, and if you get to just titrate the dose up slowly, you get the right dose with a minimum of side effects. Every medication has side effects, and you want to minimize them. This is the perfect but, delivery system. But I guess you, but, you, you know what's in the, in the drug, whereas in the marijuana plant, um, you don't know what you're getting in that product. I mean, um, pesticides. That's um, on the black market, Alan. That's, black that's, mold. The, case, that's the case for Fertilizers. regulating it. You're making our case. Thank you. Right, but you're, you're also saying that's what you're giving people. If you're making each other's case, then you're agreed. Let me ask that's another right. question here. Somebody <laughs> says. <you> <laughs> did you see Let's that? Did you see little. that? Yeah, All that's right. really nice. Please discuss the side effects to others from oh, secondhand smoke. Thanks. Uh, I've been to enough concerts where I was not, Alan. Uh, <laughs> but boy, you certainly, we were all smoking. Uh, well, the, the amount of time is what determines how, how dangerous that is. It would be hard to address. But, you know. I haven't seen any research on that at all. I mean, you I won't find any secondhand problems from marijuana because people only take one or two puffs. All of your problems are from people who chain smoke cigarettes and smoke 20, 30, 40, 50 a day. Well, why are we having this debate? Uh, John of Kihei wants to know. The, our, our state is, is so conservative we're not going to do anything. Scott Psyche says we are going to do something. Uh, we are going to decriminalize the House uh, majority there. Uh, and uh, it's just this, the time is not right right now. Do you think we will? Are we, or are we a conservative enough state that we're not going to? My interest is in who gets elected next time around, and I think that will answer the question. Um, but with respect to only taking two puffs and mm -hmm. regulating your stuff, whatever, why then does somebody need 46 to 50 marijuana cigarettes to stay under the legal decrim limit of 20 grams. Why does somebody need that? Many? There's a very good explanation for that, actually. And that is that I think everybody here agrees that smoking is the least um, healthy way to ingest this. Um, it has its benefits because it comes on right away. And if you're suffering from nausea, then, then it works well, although a vaporizer gives you the same results. But a lot of patients these days are choosing to use edible forms or tinctures or other um, concentrated forms. And to do that, they need a lot more of the raw material. And they've been telling us that you know what's permitted now, which is three ounces, is not enough. If you, if you cook it down to make a tincture, an ointment, something like this, you need a lot more. That's the simple explanation. Uh, but you know, taking it 
with a with a marijuana cigarettes better because you you take the couple tokes. It's more for a party. You can pass it around. You know, there's a communal well, aspect to it. I, that's, I'm I'm for that. There is a ceremonial effect. There's a ceremonial effect. We have to keep in mind. David from Kona wants to know: Can you please discuss the effects of Operation Green Harvest on ice use on the Big Island? I've I've had a friend of mine who's a who's a who's in that still in the academe and is still an occasional user of marijuana uh, from his youth. And he argues that uh, that green harvest uh, was very, very bad, uh, had a very bad effect because it destroyed the marijuana business. And, you know, then you go in with mixing more dangerous things and you ice and, and meth and we would have been better off just using marijuana. You know, what do you no, say I, to that, Ellen? I think there's still a lot of marijuana around. And, uh, but, I mean, the, but, but he's talking about the rise of ice. There was a very, there's a very there's obscure any correlation. Really. Well, there's a very obscure paper by uh, the Institute of Justice, and it was it's a, called a Justice Brief, and it was published in oh 1992 or something. I happen to have a copy, and it says um, it talks about the ri the uh, um, less availability of marijuana because of all the green harvest and other raids, and at the same time. Ice use started um, happening. That was when it was still coming in from the Philippines in the in the early 80s, and I my so that was what they said in this that there was a correlation that there was a, certainly a time a time um, when it, this was all happening. But my thesis is that when ice first came to the island, um, as you know, people here smoke it, which they don't do in most other places. So there was a shortage of uh, of marijuana. Your local dealer would say, "Oh, but I have something else you can smoke." And I think in the early days, people in Hawaii were naive about the effects of ice and how different it was. Uh, uh, Alan, somebody's after you. They want to know, uh, for Alan Shin, uh, Mike in <laughs> Kahalu right. wants to know, have, have, you, have you or anyone you love suffered from chronic severe pain? And if pot is the only drug that relieved the pain, what would you say? Would you want them to smoke it? Well, I, I think we go back to the same thing. There's other forms of uh, pain relief that are available. And I think that uh, smoking marijuana is not the only way to go. There was just, um, you know, the, the federal government loves to say there's no medically accepted use of marijuana. In the New England Journal of Medicine, which is the number one subscribed medical journal, last month they ran a case scenario for people who subscribe on, online, and that would be physicians, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners. And they had a woman with cancer who's run out of options. She's in a medical marijuana state, and they asked the question, she wants to use medical marijuana. Should we recommend it? They have a doctor write pro, a doctor write anti, and they polled people. And 76% of the respondents said, yes, we should recommend medical marijuana for this woman. So there's, these are mostly physicians. These are all health practitioners, and 76% are agreeing that, yes, we should do this. Uh, it's the five percent again, uh, Dr. Webb, and I think um, I think uh, you know I'm certainly compassionate for those people who really um, are terminally ill and uh, you know have no other uh, you know recourse or alternatives. Um, we would say yes. Let's you know, why not? You know they can use medical marijuana. I'm talking about the other ninety-five percent mm -hmm. who is questionable about you know their. Uh, their use of marijuana because But Alan, of our legislature set it up so that the physicians are gatekeepers. So essentially you're saying you don't trust the physicians of the state, and there's about 188 now participating in the program, that you don't trust their judgment as to whether, uh, and they have to do a risk-benefit analysis like they do for any medication, uh, looking at the person before them and their medical records. Well, again, I, I don't think it's, it's really that issue. I think that... Um, uh, Doctors are probably more prone to want to prescribe medication for pain. I think we see that across, you know, across the board. So why would you know medical marijuana docs be any 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 different from? These are not medical marijuana docs. These are the the readers of JAMA. This, this was the New England Journal oh, of Medicine. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you're, you're, let, let me ask a question ahead. because sorry. it's a it's a medical question. Somebody wants to know, Willie and I, are there any effects on unborn children of marijuana use? My grandson displays mental challenges. Could that have been related to marijuana use by Yeah, his that one parents? is not known. They did one study in Jamaica with women, and they did not find any effects. But it wasn't a very big study, so it's still unknown. So we generally advise pregnant women not to not to smoke or inhale or use any drugs if they can help it while they're pregnant. 
especially in the first trimester, the first third of the pregnancy. Uh, Susan of Molokai is ur 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 urging us, she wants us to show hands, but we don't have, uh, they, they have seen the independent lens sh show on Monday, the house I live in, it was on PBS, as I am, and so much important material regarding everything you are tonight discussing. How many of you saw it? Anybody see it? I know about it. I taped it. No. No. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. Show hands. Yeah, uh, see, none of us. Well, it says, please watch it. We'll do our best, Susan. Uh, we're running out of time. What uh, if we, if we, the same panel comes back two years from now? Will marijuana be decriminalized in Hawaii, uh, or two, uh, will it be legalized? What do you think? Hawaii Family Advocates is an electioneering organization, and we have the ability to intervene in elections, and that's what we'll be doing. So, if we're successful, no. Ellen? We have a new organization called Hawaii SAM, Smart Approaches to Marijuana, and we're building the coalition to really oppose legalization, but we are open to dialogue around uh, marijuana policies in Hawaii, including, including decriminalization, although, you know, I feel that we've already decrim marijuana as much as we can in Hawaii. Charlie, what do you think? I think as long as it's left to the legislature, they'll be very timid, and of course, you know, they're, they're paid by certain entities and have special interests. If they let the people vote, yes, it would be legalized. Uh -huh. Pam, what do you think? I think it'll definitely be decriminalized in two years. Whether or not they'll be bold enough to legalize it will depend a lot on what happens in Washington and Colorado State. And we have a new coalition, too. Say it real quick. <laughs> FreshApproachHawaii.org. That's it. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much for coming. Thanks very much, Alan, Charlie. Thanks very, very Thank much. So much. We appreciate it. Next week on Insights, every governor and mayor in recent memory has, de has declared helping Honolulu's homeless population among their top priorities. Homelessness is a complex issue, which we'll explore with policymakers, homeless advocates, and service providers. That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Boylan. Ahui home.